I'm Robin Banks. I'm one of the members of the advisory board of the Melbourne Social Equity Institute. And it's a really great pleasure to be introducing our first speaker for the day for this plenary professor, emeritus professor, Ron McCallum. Um, I've known Ron for a number of years through um, Sydney University Law School, where I was on his advisory board. I'm quite good at advisory boards, it seems. Um, and Ron is you know, known to many people, and, but I'm still going to do the intro. Oh, Emeritus Professor Ron McCallum AO studied law at Monash University here in Melbourne, graduating in 1972. In 1974, he completed a Master's of Law degree under the Commonwealth Scholarship and Fellowship Plan at Queen's University in Canada. It was at that point that Ron developed his interest, probably, and expertise for what he's most famous for in, law, in employment and labour law. It's certainly what I knew him as in Sydney at, at the law school there. After teaching at Monash for 18 years, he moved to Sydney in 1993, where he was appointed to a full professorship at the University of Sydney. He served as Dean of the University of Sydney Law School from 2002 to 2007. And as I say, that's where I first um, actually formally met Ron and had the pleasure of working with him on, I guess, the development of the law school uh, during his period as Dean. In January 2011, when he retired, the Senate of the University awarded Ron the title of Emeritus Professor. His expertise in labour and occupational health and safety law saw him appointed as chair and member or member of various federal and state inquiries, the most recent of which was the 2012 inquiry into the Fair Work Act. He's also a director of the board of Vision Australia. He was made an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2006 for his services to tertiary education, for industrial relations advice, to governments, for assistance to people with vision impairments and for social justice. And in 2011, Ron was Senior Australian of the Year. He was nominated by the Australian Government as an independent expert for the, Univers for the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities when that committee was first established in 2008. He served as an inaugural member, then chair of the committee, and also following that as vice chair until the conclusion of his term in 2014. He also served as the chair of the UN Committee of Chairs of all the UN treaty bodies in 2011-12. And I think Ron's term as chair of that UN committee really brought that committee together. And I think that um, that is a hallmark of what Ron is very good at doing is, is getting people to work effectively together. In 2013, August, uh, Ron was sworn in as a part-time member of the Australian Administrative Appeals Tribunal, both in its general division and also in its relatively new NDIS division, a very important division for ensuring the rights of people with disability under the NDIS. Um, Ron's going to talk to us today about uh, the UN Committee and its work, I guess, and, and I certainly will be fascinated to hear that. So please welcome Ron. Thank you, Robin, so much. <clears throat> That's very, very kind of you to read out all of that <clears throat> material. <clears throat> Makes me a little bit embarrassed. How are you all? OK? I just wanted to see if there are some people there, you know, with the train strike. <laughs> But even if there's only two of you, I'll give the lecture. Okay. And apparently you're supposed to tweet, I don't believe in it, but apparently people do. And I'm very much a libertarian, so if that's what you want to do. And I believe it helps the rating of this very important conference. And I'm truly honoured to have been invited by um, Professor McSherry, who used to be my tutor once, and then she became famous, um, to uh, speak at this conference. Can I begin by paying my deepest respects to the Coolum Nation on whose land I'm standing and on whose land you're sitting? I feel a great and close affinity with the elders. After all, the elders of Indigenous nations are the custodians of the law. And as an aged Emeritus Professor, I feel in some ways a custodian of our laws. And so with that custodial communion, 
I pay them my deepest respect. On Saturday the 3rd of May 2008, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I shall call the CRPD, came into force. Under the provisions of the CRPD, it would come into force 30 days after the 20th nation had lodged its ratification documents with the United Nations. So, on the 3rd of May this year, the actual enforceable convention will turn eight. Of course, we all know that it was passed by the General Assembly on the 13th of December 2006. But conventions don't just spring out of the air. They require pretty much a consensus in the General Assembly of the United Nations. What we saw in the last third of the 20th century and in the beginning of this century were a series of conventions to try and deal with issues that were current. For example, in 1979, the General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, which grew out of very much the women's movement. Similarly, in 1984, the General Assembly adopted the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman of Punishments, uh, which grew out of the concerns about the increased levels of torture and punishment on our planet. And in 1989, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, grew out of our increased concern in the world about the plight of our children. And, of course, the CRPD grew out of the concerns of the disability movement over the previous 40 years, but up to 2006. And I would like to acknowledge colleagues who negotiated that convention, my good friend Rosemary, o, Rosemary Caius, an extraordinary scholar, and the mercurial Graham Innes. I'd also want to say that Australia was one of the early nations to ratify the CRPD. It did so on the 17th of July 2008. And by that stage, disability had become bipartisan, and I acknowledge the Honourable Philip Ruddock, now MP, who as Attorney General between 2003 and 2007 in the Howard government, brought with pressure the Australian government around to supporting the CRPD. So we ratified on the 17th, 17th of July, and then on the 21st of August 2009, we signed the optional protocol, which allow individuals to bring complaints to the CRPD committee if their convention rights have been violated. Why were we one of the early ratifiers of the convention? Well, it was the, new, the blooming of the Rudd government which wanted to become closer to the United Nations and the Rudd government saw this as a way to show, if you like, a new Australia, unquote, or quote, unquote. And so, you know, by November 2008, only 41 countries had ratified the CRPD. Most of the Europeans hadn't. The Canadians hadn't, Australia and New Zealand, and uh, developing countries. Nowadays, we have seen the convention ratified. I think, I find it hard to keep count, and Charlotte McLean, who gave that, that truly amazing speech yesterday morning, would probably have a better finger. But I think it's about 162 or 163 countries, as well as the European Union, that have ratified the CRPD. It is the second fastest ratified convention in the history of the conventions. The fastest ratifier was the Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC. I guess we all love our own children and other children. We should, certainly, except when we send them back to Nauru, which is just outrageous. But leaving, leaving my personal views aside on that, um, we are the second. Why is that so? I think because of the disability movement and there was a general recognition that persons with disabilities in the world were living in poverty and needed education, employment, etc. And I'll come back to this. I don't think that the majority of countries that ratified the CRPD were enthralled by human rights. <laughs> I think they were concerned and recognised what I might call needs of persons with disabilities. And let me come back to that. What uh, is the purpose of the convention? Now, I'm doing this without notes. Uh, and without slides, I'm trying to be Demosthenes reincarnated, if you remember. 
he didn't have slides either, nor did Shakespeare, nor did Newton. So, <coughs> and they never tweeted either, nor do I. <laughs> I remember the story um, told by a, one of my meditating heroes, I do a lot of meditation, that he went around Africa, it was Father John Lawrence, with his camera, he kept taking pictures, and uh, when he got back he found the camera hadn't worked. And he said, I was actually sorry I didn't look. Okay. Um, the first article of the convention says, the purpose of the present convention is to protect, promote and encourage the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons with disabilities and to safeguard our inherent dignity. And as Rosemary said yesterday, it isn't to create new rights, but it is to ensure that our human rights are protected and that our inherent dignity is protected. Uh, who are covered by the convention? Well, the second uh, section, sec second sentence of Article 1 says something like, persons with disabilities include all those with long-term physical, um, cognitive and or sensory impairments, which in interaction with barriers, various barriers, hinder or prevent the full enjoyment of, of life on an equal basis with others. And we call that the social model of disability and we try and contrast that with the fact that there was this medical model in the past and we're trying to beat it down. Can I suggest to you, I'm not sure there ever was a medical model. I think it's a bit of a straw man. I think there was in the past an emphasis upon medical solutions, but it was just one of a number of things including social welfare solutions and other solutions. And I, I think that people like Finkelstein got it wrong, great uh, scholar, and I think that Tom Shakespeare got it right. Um, the sort of medical model is an ideal type, and to use sort of the German phraseology, it, it, it's a straw man that doesn't really exist, almost like the man on the Clapham omnibus for those who did law school years ago. But nevertheless, the social model does, does operate. Now, what I want to do in the rest of this lecture is to compare and contrast what I shall call Australia's national needs approach to disability with the operation of the, the CRPD committee, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which operates what I might call a human rights approach in its purest sense. And perhaps it's because there's different functions. Governments, when they're dealing with disabilities issues, have to think about budgets and have to think about realpolitik. Whereas the committee, and now I'm no longer in it, I can, can sort of stand at arm's length and try and criticise it uh, and, and say what's good and what, what I think is a bit strange. Um, the committee is dealing with really human rights per se. And as I shall try and show, there are advantages and disadvantages in both approaches, the national needs approach and the human rights approach. And what happens is, that when governments like Australia end up before the committee, <clears throat> they're like ships passing in the night, with the Australian government speaking a needs approach and the committee speaking a human rights approach. Now, many nations transition from a national needs approach to a human rights approach, but Australia is not a nation that's about to transition down a human rights track. So let me try and compare and contrast in the few minutes available to me how this works. The national needs approach. In November 2008, the Parliamentary Secretary for International Aid, Bob McMullen, launched Australia's disability aid program. Now, Article 32 of the CRPD says that uh, nations should be involved in assisting persons with disabilities in the area of foreign aid. Development for all, was the strategy was called. Now, there'd been a, a lot of useful pr preparatory work in this needs approach. There had been consultations in August and September 2008 with disability organisations, and I want to sing the praises of a great friend of Mary's and mine, um, uh, Kirsten Pratt, who was one of the major people behind this. And the whole idea was that we could assist persons with disabilities in countries that we did work with, um, East Timor, which has a new name that I get confused about, Cambodia, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. And that program 
I think would not have had the impetus had we not had the CRPD. I'm not saying the CRPD caused that program, but it was a catalyst that enabled Australia to put a lot of money into the disability area. And that program is, was one of the best in the world, uh, as you can see from the 2012 review of Development for All. We then saw um, the um, Abbott government seeking to involve the private sector and saying that it wouldn't affect the disability parts of AusAid, which were now subsumed into foreign affairs. I'm not quite up to date with all the money switching that's going on with foreign aid and all the cuts, but I suspect that those cuts have affected our disability programs, which is a great pity. Now, the second issue I want to talk about in the national needs approach is a national disability strategy. Now, we have had, at the state level, many programs assisting we persons with disabilities. I guess from the Disability Services Act in 1986 in Victoria, you can trace that through uh, Brian Howe, the Deputy Prime Minister. More recently in New South Wales, you had the Stronger Together program. Um, but once we signed and ratified the CRPD, the government was determined to have what we might call a national disability strategy. And the person that was to drive that was then a new parliamentarian, Bill Shorten, now the opposition leader. Many might have thought, why would such an ambitious man take disability and children's services as a parliamentary secretary? Minister Bill, as I playfully call him, I hope he doesn't mind, um, he was one of my students at Monash and I'm, I'm very pleased that he entered into the disability area and he made quite a success. He established the National People with Disabilities and Carers Council in 2008, ably chaired by Ron de Galbally, who'd been around a long time and would be known to many of you. That uh, committee helped with the National Disability Strategy. It, it published its report um, in 2009, you would have read it, the shutout report, People with Disabilities in Australia and Their Families and it showed that many people felt excluded under the present system. And that led to the development in 2010 of the NDS, National Disability Strategy 2010 to 2020. And on February the 11th, 2011, just five years ago, the COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, adopted that strategy. And when you look at the report in 2013, it showed that that strategy was having some traction but that more had to be done. I haven't caught up with the 2015 report, but I think the same would be more has to be done, particularly um, with state coffers running out of money. The, the NDS has a series of pillars, including justice, including housing, including social inclusion and employment. Now, it's made some advances in housing and, and social inclusion and in transport, it's actually failed in the area of employment. And I'll come back to employment. Um, persons with disabilities make up 53% of the labour force participation rate. That is, you look at people between the ages of 16 and 65. Um, I now no longer fit into that. And you find out how many are at work and how many aren't. In the general community, it's 82%. And in the disability community, it's 53%. And if you look at persons with cognitive or um, Psychosocial disabilities, it drops down to 41%. For women, it's less, it's about 49%. So we still haven't moved those figures and we're still about 27th amongst the OECD countries. But nevertheless, that strategy, I suggest to you, would not have come about if it had not been for the CRPD because we were required to have a strategy. And again, I, I commend Minister Shorten, or Opposition Leader Mr Shorten, and those who were involved in the shutout report and in the National Disability Strategy. It got signed by all governments. And the third and final area of this needs approach is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS. Now, I think it's also fair to say that Minister or Parliamentary Secretary Bill Shorten, as he then was, and my good friend uh, Jenny Macklin, were very much behind the NDIS. Some of the material came from the National People and Carers Council. Uh, Mr. Walsh from PricewaterhouseCoopers, another great dis disabled person um, who did all the actuarial work. When uh, Julia Gillard was 
misguidedly voted out of office by her party. Um, she said the two most important things she did were the NDIS and the Royal Commission into um, Children in Institutions, in other words, that's going on at the moment, sexual misconduct, etc. And I think she's right. What's interesting about the NDS, IS, is that it, that it was decided by the Prime Minister in April 2012 that that's the way the government would go for. I did not believe in 2009 it could ever move that quickly. But again, impetus about disability. In April 2013, the Gillard government announced that it would increase the Medicare levy from 1.5% to 2% to pay for it. And the opposition leader, Mr Abbott, said he agreed. He didn't agree with the carbon tax or the mining tax, but he agreed with this one. In other words, we had at that stage a bipartisan approach to this disability issue, and there was a recognition, I don't think about people's human rights, but there was a recognition there were needs to be fulfilled, that we needed to give we persons with disabilities a fair go, that we needed to ensure that we had full participation in the community, and the whole idea behind the plan was to allow persons with disabilities to have access to supports to enable us to go to work, to enable us to live full lives. And as you all know, it started off with four launch sites, Newcastle and here in Geelong and in uh, South Australia uh, for children uh, initially. Then we had other places moving in. The Blue Mountains was the latest in Sydney. And I think later on this year, it's fully rolled out in all states other than Western Australia where there's a two-tiered approach with the Western Australian state scheme. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. I sit on NDIS appeals, which is a very compl complex and responsible thing to do. And it takes a lot of effort on my part and a good deal of angst. Well, I put it to you that this is, when you look back on it, from 2008 to 2016, quite a remarkable change in our country on the outlook of persons with disabilities. But can I suggest to you it's based upon a needs approach and there is a, what I might call, I don't know how to say this, a charity element. This is what we should do as a society. I don't think people think in terms of human rights. I think it's almost like a fair go all round, or this is, this is what we should do, uh, that people with disabilities that we're, we're now recognised. And when Australia went before the UN committee, it wanted to tell this story. It said, we've been really good. Look what we've done. If you look at what, compared to what we did in the past, what we neglected in the past, and it was like ships passing in the night, and the committee was saying, we're, we're concerned about human rights. We think what you've done, everyone should have done, and that's where you start. Now, I should say that although I was a member of the committee then, I'm no longer a member. Let me be very clear, and I don't want to talk about the past. I was, as a citizen, I was not involved in the dialogue with Australia, and I watched it from my hotel room, lying there, comatose, watching it on the internet, as people were in Australia. So I, I wasn't at all. I wasn't even in the same room. Let me then talk and contrast this national needs approach with what I might call the human rights approach of the CRPD committee. And remember, first of all, the CRPD committee members are elected, 18 of them now, from around the world by all the ratifying countries. And they're now elected for four-year terms. And their job, and let me talk about their job before we get into the, the election process. Under Article 35 of the CRPD Committee, um, under Article 35, all countries that have ratified the Convention must produce an initial report on how their country is complying with the CRPD within two years. And after that, every four years, and now they've introduced a simplified reporting mechanism, but I won't go into that because the Committee is still dealing and will deal for almost the next decade with uh, initial reports. And the whole idea of these initial reports is for countries to go through the convention article by article and say what they're doing. And so the committee receives those reports and elects a country rapporteur, and that country rapporteur will read the report and will read any shadow or alternative reports from DPOs, disabled persons organisations in the particular country. 
and will then write a list of questions called the list of issues, which are then sent to the government. They were sent to the Australian government. The Australian government will reply, and then you will have the constructive dialogue which is on the net. And if you want to watch <coughs> the ships passing in the night Australian thing, um, you can watch it on the internet. They're all archived. Um, and it happens uh, in a process where there's two three-hour sessions, one in the afternoon that goes for three hours, and the next session in the next morning for three hours in which the committee members question the Australian government on the convention. And I might add, I want to commend um, his work, Graham Minnis, as Disability Discrimination Commissioner at that stage in 2013, um, made an opening independent statement before the committee and then made a closing independent statement and we should be very proud of what he did. And after that's done, the committee goes away and the country rapporteur does a draft concluding observations. These are between three and 4,000 words in length. And then the committee goes into a closed session where every paragraph of those concluding observations is argued about. And, and, and so you, you see a compromise in a sense because you've got 18 people from all around the world who, want a, who have a view and you put it together. So there's an element of generality in these concluding observations and then they're given to the countries concerned. Okay, let's look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of the CRPD committee before we then, we then, we then start looking at things. First of all, it's elected by the state's parties. And it's a complicated process whereby states' parties are electing people to various UN committees. And so the question is, look at this, and if you vote, if you vote for my guy on the CRPD committee, I'll vote for your guy for the International Court of Justice, or I'll vote for your guy on the CEDAW committee, what we might call playing swapsies. But one of the interesting things is that ever since, I think, 2013, 17 of the 18 members of the committee are persons with disabilities. And that's true today. I think the only one that is not is a person from Latvia. Now, that has some strengths and it has some weaknesses. I think one of the strengths is that you've got people who have lived experience with disabilities and sitting with them or just watching them you can see that they have a special interest in the convention because they're saying, this is me. Now, I know women sit on CEDAW and women and men who are mums and dads sit on CR, CRC, but I think it's quite different with a minority. And now I think we've reached a stage where states' parties don't dare put up anyone who's not disabled. They feel that they're not doing the right thing. And yet I think at the moment it would be better if we spread disability, if we had people on the CRPD committee who weren't disabled, and if we had some disabled people on CEDAW, on the Human Rights Committee. I'm very nervous because these things are being recorded, but let me say, <laughs> um, the CRPD committee has had some differences in relation to Article 12 and also liberty and Article 13 on access to justice with the Human Rights Committee and also with the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture. My sense is that some of those, a minority of members of those committees, do not take the CRPD committee seriously because there's this notion, well, look, they're disabled and they, they're, they're too closely involved. That's why I'd like to see disability spread throughout the UN. I would like to see on the committee a parent of a disabled child. We have never had a parent. Can I say that when you look at the Australian approach, its national needs approach, one of the biggest lobbyist groups, and they lobby me continually, are parents of disabled children. They lobby government. As a CRPD committee, we have never been lobbied by parents and we don't have a parent and I think that's missing. I also think that in the coming years, to look at how we can have a breadth of expertise on the CRPD committee, particularly when it gets into more difficult terrain, we might want to have people who don't have um, a disability but who are experts in the area and have, through long practice, done good work. Now, I think to contrast the human rights approach with the national needs approach, let me take three areas. Um, legal capacity, 
sterilised, non-therapeutic sterilisation of women and girls with cognitive disabilities, and voting rights and jury service. When you read, and the, the CRPD committee has now um, dialogued with 31 countries as well as the European Union, and I think there'll be another 13 this year, starting off in March. When you read the concluding observations, there's a sameness to them. The committee is very concerned about the plight of children with disabilities. The committee is very concerned under Article 16 about violence to people with disabilities, particularly women and girls with disabilities. The committee is very concerned about the lack of education, Article 24. The committee is very concerned about access to justice, Article 13. And the committee is very concerned about voting rights and cultural rights. And, and when you read all the concluding observations, most nations fall foul of this, I suggest because nations are focusing upon needs and not really upon our human rights and dignity. Although nations are transitioning, like Sweden and some of the Scandinavian countries are transitioning, Australia is way behind the pack. Let's look at some of these issues. Article 12 is the one on legal capacity, which makes it very clear that all persons with disabilities, including those with cognitive and or psychosocial disabilities, should have full legal capacity. And it says that, country, that um, nations should have mechanisms to assist persons with disabilities to exercise their full legal capacity. And you see that as a linchpin. And the committee wrote a general comment on uh, Article 12 in April 2013. Um, that comment has had a lot of pushback from psychiatrists, but I'm not sure one will ever convince a psychiatrist. And a lot of people expected far too much from a general comment, as though it would be the roadmap that would solve all problems. It's just the beginning of the process. Uh, Australia got got commended for some of the work it was doing in uh, South, Austra South, South Australia and in New South Wales. And at that stage, we didn't have the Commonwealth report uh, into, into legal capacity under Commonwealth laws. But if that were to be followed, we would make great strides. And we've got people here like Bernadette McSherry looking at support and decision making. So we're doing something in that area, but we're still not ahead of the pack. In the area of sterilisation, we are unbelievably backward. Under Australian mosaic of laws, girls, I guess it applies to boys and girls, but I think it's really only girls, that is children, girl children with cognitive disabilities may be sterilised for non-therapeutic reasons provided there is a tribunal or a court decision. And while there was a Senate report in, uh, by the Community Affairs Committee in 2014 or 15. That report didn't suggest that we change that. So not only the CRPD committee have been up in arms, but we've also seen the CEDAW committee, the CRC committee, and then the Universal Periodic Review. Again, I do not understand why we permit this barbaric practice when there are many other ways of dealing with that issue. In the area of voting, we provide <clears throat> in section 93, subsection 8, paragraph A, that persons, quote, with unsound mind, unquote, should not be allowed to vote. And there is a practice of taking persons off the electoral roll or even not putting them on if they have a cognitive disability. And often they apply, often electoral officers with no training apply an individualistic test. Well, I reckon we ought to have a test for those under 75. I think we ought to have a test for all those with university degrees. Most of them aren't, you know. It wasn't long ago we didn't allow women to vote. Now, people say, well, we're trying to protect fraud. Goodness me, there's a lot of other fraudulent ways and fraudulent use of money, the way Clive... Palmer utilised very wealth to get people into the Senate. I guess that, that's perfectly legal. I don't want to be defamed. That was perfectly legal what he did. <laughs> Just the Australian public didn't understand. Um, but seriously, um, the committee held in 2013 in a case called Zolt, S-Z-A-L-T, against Hungary, which had a similar process that this was contrary to Article 29, that... Article 29 was to allow all persons with disabilities the right to vote, free from tests. 
And we've had issues with the Human Rights Committee in the past on that. But I feel very strongly that that's our rights. Australia just can't fathom that that could be the case. Uh, even though, thankfully, the, the Human Rights Commission's report into legal capacity says the law should be changed, but a parliamentary committee just a year ago said no. Jury service. In many states, it's not possible for blind or deaf people to serve on juries, although there have been some changes of recent years. I've been heavily involved in this, and people say to me, well, you know, you, 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 know, you can't expect these sort of people to sit on juries. And, you, know, you, you, you understand. If, you know, you're like us. You're a lawyer, and you, know, you understand how these disabled people work. <clears throat> I feel like, you know, honorary white status in the area of apartheid. <clears throat> I said, you know, you're dressed nicely. You can, we can talk to you about this. I said, well, you, you can talk to me all you like, but I can tell you what my view is. Anyway, um, AM, and I won't use names, um, brought a complaint the first and only complaint to reach the committee from Australia. The first so far, there are a series of complaints in the pipeline asserting that he was being discriminated against because if he was called for jury service, they wouldn't allow Auslan in the jury room. Now, reasonable minds may differ, but the committee decided that the complaint wasn't made out because he hadn't already been called for jury service. The committee were... I think the committee is, is concerned in its early years not to get involved in hypothetical situations. Of course, you can, you can come that the other way. I think the committee um, looked at cases like Tobin. You may remember the, the gay man who brought proceedings in the Human Rights Committee about um, the fact that every time he had homosexual intercourse um, in his own bedroom with an adult, he was breaking the Tasmanian criminal law. And I think the difference there was that every time he engaged in in sexual practice, um, he was committing an offence, whereas AM was not committing an offence because he had not yet been called for jury service. But again, I think I'd like the Australian government to take a lead in that area. Um, I actually think that the Australian government has a long way to go to transition from a national needs approach to a human rights approach. One example might be that under section Article 33 of the Convention, paragraph 2, we're supposed to establish an independent monitoring mechanism, which could include the Human Rights Commission, but it has to include persons with disabilities and disabled persons organisations. See Article 33, paragraphs 2 and 3. I've had discussions with the Australian Government and they said, what do you really mean, Ron? I said, well, it, it, it's pretty simple. You establish this monitoring... Well, what would they do? And I said, well, they would, they would see how we're implementing the convention. And they say, you mean we'd have to discuss with them? And I said, yeah, that's part of the dialogue. <laughs> They're good at setting up bodies that they can talk with, reference groups. And I mean no criticism. I sat on the National People with Disability and Carers Council for four or five years till it was abolished. But it wasn't a purely disability organisation. It had on it leaders of trade unions whose members worked in the, in the disability sector. It had on it, if I can call them, charities who provided services to persons with disabilities and people with disabilities were a minority. And it had carers. I have nothing wrong with those groups. But we still haven't come to grips with a national monitoring mechanism in its fullest sight because we still don't see the human rights dimensions of the Convention. What's going to happen in the next few... I would like to think that Australia will transition to a human rights approach, but I think it's unlikely in the next half decade. The committee has a lot of work to do. Um, I hope it continues to do the work it's been doing, but I think it, it probably has to become a lot more sophisticated. And I, I, I'm, I don't mean any special pleading on my part, but I think one of the provisions of the Convention in Article 34 is too narrowly drawn. It says that committee members can only be elected for two terms. Now, I serve my two terms. I'm not interested in going back after 19 trips to Geneva. Um, my old body wouldn't take it. But I think that that means the turnover on the committee is very high. 
and I think three terms would have been better. So I'm hoping that despite the high turnover, the state's parties will elect sufficient expertise so that the committee can continue its dynamic work. And I hope those of us here will carefully nudge the Australian government and say, look, we're very pleased with the national needs approach, but don't forget our human rights. Bless you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>